Welcome everybody, this is the SharePoint Community Call, October 2020 edition. It is October 13th, unless I'm completely mistaken, it's 2020, so you never know uh, the, the, on the days anymore. And today we'll have a pretty busy agenda. Uh, so we're gonna go through some of the general, uh, let's say news. Uh, we're gonna go through a quick monthly summary. Well, in one slide, we're gonna call out all of the community contributors who've been active, not only on SharePoint community, but across the Microsoft 365 community efforts. Uh, and then we'll have a optional picture time. And hopefully the first three sections and quite a few slides, we can actually do in the first 15 minutes. And then after that we can, or 15 minutes or so, and then after that, we'll have 20 minutes time uh, for Pat and Luca around the latest on SharePoint framework, the next steps and Q&A. Uh, and that's also Q&A for you. So if you're thinking on having an awesome or if you have an awesome question related on SPFX and the future of SPFX, please share that in the chat. Not yet, but during that session so we can actually have that discussion during there. And then the second topic today is from Andre. Andre is actually probably almost the newest member in my team. So in our uh, platform team, um, and he's been concentrating on the performance improvements um, and then potentially we'll see a preview of Project Nucleus unless I'm completely mistaken. But let's see what entry uh, entry is going to cover on that section and most likely we'll have the Q&A uh, going uh, on during the call rather than in the end but again let's see how the timelines are going now quick recap again on the on the classical assets what we have so just a reminder uh, if you're wondering on where we get started and where you can, can find more information around anything related on Microsoft 365 and development so we have two different YouTube channel we have the Microsoft 365 Developer Videos YouTube channel, and then we have uh, the Community YouTube channel. Both of them uh, have uh, videos around and demos around the different topics on the Microsoft 365 development. We do have multiple open source uh, GitHub uh, organizations. We do have sample galleries, uh, and I'm just saying that the, the team sample gallery picture is missing from that one, but the newest sample gallery is actually Microsoft Teams, targeted Teams sample gallery. We can find different, find bots, different bots. Apps and exit extensibility. And then if you're wondering, there's too many URLs, I can't handle all of this stuff, way too many things to remember. And the easiest URL to remember is AKMS M365 BNP. From there, you'll find the latest and links uh, links to the YouTube channels, to the Microsoft Craft SDK, to the Microsoft Teams Toolkit, to the SPFX documentation and all of that stuff. So everything from a one location, so you can easily find what's relevant for you. Good, good. Um, quick recap, uh, because this is the SharePoint monthly community call, uh, I just wanted to call out, and there was a lot of cool, really cool announcements, not only on the dev and extensibility side of the house uh, related on SharePoint, um, and you probably want to go and check them out in the AKMS SP blog, and this is the tech community blog, which is the official non-development side of the SharePoint, um, or the blog uh, platform on there because there's actually really, really cool announcements, which obviously from an extensibility point of view uh, will take advantage as well. But there's a really cool announcement related on uh, the upcoming portal embedding capabilities or the, the home app uh, in the Microsoft Teams, so you can actually have a really cool experience uh, in the in the Microsoft Teams side. We also talked about uh, the app launcher in the Microsoft in the SharePoint side, which is the picture on the left below, uh, where there's a left app launcher coming on the on the uh, SharePoint as well. We also talked about uh, the upcoming template, so site template engine is going to be completely revamped, and it's going to be based on site designs and site scripts. So there's going to be new functionalities and and capabilities around that. And then as part of the Ignite announcements, we also announced uh, the SharePoint Spaces being G8, uh, which is really, really cool. So you can actually have abilities and build experiences in 3D without the requirement of having a headset. Um, and there will be really cool customer, uh, actually uh, customer cases on this one pretty soon because I saw a preview of one of them yesterday and that was really mind blowing. So really showing the value out of the SharePoint Spaces in a customer scenarios. Now, I wanted to also quickly uh, recap, uh, if you're wondering on where we are from a SharePoint perspective, again, SharePoint monthly call, um, on the SharePoint user voice list, this is the 
top 10 list on the non-dev side of the user voice for SharePoint. And from here, I can just pinpoint few items. I know, ex uh, for example, enabling the renaming of SharePoint tenant domain. We are actively looking on that one. and There's active work being on that one. So the number one item in here is going to be tackled sooner or later. It is actually a surprisingly complicated thing because the domain uh, of the tenant has such a tremendous impact inside of the technology. And now uh, maybe a second one, just a uh, call out from here, a total revamp of wikis. You've actually probably seen already uh, that the, the modern pages, you can actually do like a linking between the modern pages. So we're heading to the right direction and there will be investments on those areas as well. And obviously this is the view for threshold and all of that is getting addressed. So a lot of work being invested in here. And yes, <laughs> thank you, thank you, uh, Paul, for calling it out. There is a a one of the items has a lowercase p, which I will go and update the item. But original submitter of that item did a, a lowercase p, and that's the reason why it's actually lowercase in the in the list of things. So I didn't actually want to go and update that yet. On the dev side of the house, uh, the number one uh, request, uh, we've been actually tackling quite a lot of stuff here from the taxonomy APIs. There's, there's a SharePoint framework in store. All of that has been already released. The number one item on the dev side uh, is, the, is the overriding of the custom modern uh, forms or custom forms using an SPFX webpart. And this is something which is coming up all the time. Time. So we are aware of that request. We're still internally uh, uh, like evaluating the priority of that one. And there's this multiple opinions related on do we want to do that? Do we not want to do that? And if we don't want to do that, what is the alternative for making that happen? Now, for any of these items in the user voice, more votes always count. So if there are certain areas, certain capabilities here, which are super important for you, go and vote, vote, vote because that voting not only in user voice, but in general counts. So all of the numbers do actually count. Uh, also, I want to call out uh, as example support for SharePoint 2016-2019 for .NET standard APIs. There is an ongoing discussions on that one now, but it's actually getting a lot of votes in here. So maybe at some point sooner or later, we'll, we'll have a CSM.NET standard for uh, on-premises uh, released as well. But again, it really depends on your votes and your input around these things. We do apologize. It might take a while always to get the feature available, but those votes actually count. So we do have a discussions internally on this all the time. Now, the next slide, I'm going to actually throw the ball quickly on, on and David on this one, because it's easier that David will explain quickly the dates. David? Take it away. Absolutely. Thank you, Vesa. So just real quickly, we know in the patterns and practices community that it is open source, and that means that you can contribute. But we also know that that process uh, can be a little intimidating. There could be some confusing barriers to how to contribute and, in fact, how to consume some of the tools and resources we have available. This Sharing is Caring initiative helps by providing hands-on, step-by-step live guidance in sessions where we will walk you through step-by-step -step how to take advantage of some of these initiatives like contributing and consuming. Um, it's also worth noting, it's not only for developers, it's for IT pros and those who are looking to contribute to the community by way of documentation and guidance. And they're all completely free. Uh, the sessions build upon one another. And so we definitely recommend you start with the first time contributor sessions, which we've already scheduled for November but we also have community doc sessions and uh, SPFX samples using NVM available for October and November dates will be coming available for those as well. So please go to aka.ms, sharing is caring, register completely free of charge. We'd love to have you and help you and see your contributions in the community. That's it back to you. Excellent. Thank you, David, on that one. And, and these sessions, by the way, they're getting such a tr lot of, lot of, lot of positive feedback. So please, please, please go and check them out. David and Hugo are typically hosting them, uh, and people seem to be enjoying uh, on learning new stuff and getting started on, on on learning how to contribute in Docs or in GitHub or in open source in general. So super, super important. Now, a few kind of recaps on on the things uh, or the podcasts and the uh, video blocking which we have available from engineering. So one one of these is the BMP weekly just today we released and it and thank you for the feedback already on the on the channel or in the chat and apparently it was a good episode so we had the episode 100 in a way that sebastian levert from valo internet was actually hosting and then asking questions from me and waldeck who's been hosting the 99 nine episodes of the bmp weekly and this is available in the video format or in the podcast format the other one if you're more interested so this one is is on more general level so not just dev stuff but also dev stuff um, as well but if you're 
only interested on the dev stuff, uh, there is also Microsoft 365 Developer Podcast hosted by uh, Jeremy Fake and Paul Shuffling, uh, which is a great weekly podcast also on covering up on, on what's actually happening, what's new stuff related on uh, Microsoft 365 development. Now, moving on, uh, before we go to the, uh, to the actual uh, demos and the stars of today. So quickly recap the October 2020, let's say the monthly summary blog post, which is the long one, which is explaining all of the different things, what is happening is coming out tomorrow. And that's that's mainly because I've been having a hard time of finalizing that blog post. It is growing and growing and growing and collecting all of the contributors uh, every single month is getting more and more time consuming, which is a positive problem because we're getting more and more people in, engaged and involved in the community. Um, but it, that's uh, coming tomorrow, so the blog post will be released tomorrow and you'll see it in social media. But before the blog post getting out, we already want to call out uh, all of the people who have been contributing within the September, within the past month. And this time we needed to split this to two slides. So we were unable to actually squeeze in all of the names in a single slide because the font size would have been six pixels. So we actually uh, did a all time record of the uh, community contributors in our open source efforts. So thank you for that one. You are truly having massive impact in the worldwide and helping others to to actually uh, helping others to learn how to do extensibility or how to do or learn how to use Microsoft 365 by sharing your learnings and the second slide and this is all about creating that uh, community feeling helping others in the community almost like a family uh, of people especially now in 2020 when everybody is well most of us are forced to work from home and most of us have to stay in home as well unfortunately having this kind of a virtual community absolutely helps uh, on being engaged and then still empowering others which is super super cool so thank you everybody for helping on this thanks now, um, this is also the list of all of the companies which we have a, a permission to show the logo. So if you were one of those contributors, which were mentioned in a previous slide and your logo, your company logo is not here, please send us the permissions to show your local company logo so we can actually call it out as the companies who are allowing their employees to contribute into open source. Um, but thank you for all of these companies as well. Now, what's really, really cool also is that we had all time highest Microsoft employee contributions within the past month as well. So we're getting this is growing all the time as well. And more and more people are being active from the Microsoft employee uh, side as well. Now we are heading to the demo section, but before we go to the demo section, it's picture time. So. If you've been in our community call, you probably know how this works. Uh, we kind of, if you are willing to actually share your, uh, your screen, just enable the, the, the video and I will share to get them out actually flips on my team and we can actually see what's happening and how many people are enabling video. Unless I'm completely mistaken, we do have a limit of like 50 attendees uh, on the same time. Go, oh, oh, there it is. Okay, now we can see people. There's Paolo, there's uh, other people. Paolo, smile. <laughs> let's see how long does it actually take. We're not going to take it too, too much time in here, but let's see if we can get uh, additional people for a nice attendee video. Yes, I got a one picture. There we go. Oh, that was more than enough uh, for most of you. Got a one picture of that. Okay, cool. Next, we'll go to the actual stars of the call, who are Luca and Pat. And then we'll have Andre after this one. Luca. Hello, guys. You're in the uh, call. That's good. Yes, I am. <laughs> I've been on the call uh, since uh, the beginning, 8 a.m. here in uh, the rainy Washington state. Cool. And Pat should be in the call as well. Yep. Hello there. OK. so. Do you have a slide with the um, what's coming, right, Beza? Uh, yeah. So, so um, I have a few slides from your Ignite presentation as as communicated. So this one, do you want to? Sure. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll be your lovely assistant. You'll yeah, just say to me when we go to the following slide. That, which is fine. I mean, you guys. No SharePoint framework, of course, that's why you guys are here. Uh, SharePoint framework, the uh, number one 
UX extensibility model for Microsoft 365 based on JavaScript started as a way to create widget on SharePoint pages and involved with more and more in Microsoft 365 workload with a heavy focus on Microsoft Teams, which from which you can create uh, tabs as well as uh, ability to um, extend messaging extension with dialog in Microsoft Teams starting for the latest version of the SharePoint framework that we created. Uh, we already reached the 14 major versions since we, we have been live for a little bit more than two years, we say. Uh, and uh, we have been tremendous growth. Thank you for you guys and for all the uh, dedication you have put by using SharePoint Framework and creating your solution for Microsoft 365. Okay, so in, in, in 1.11, uh, quick recap, we increased our ability to create solution for Microsoft 365 by being able to have task modules, Microsoft Teams can leverage SharePoint framework capability to enrich your Teams solutions. Uh, we also been as enabled the ability to create uh, Microsoft SharePoint framework on the store. And as part of that, we did a couple of things. And one of the things was uh, being able to provide your developer information in the package so that we can use that uh, first and foremost to be able to track the information on the store as well as being able to provide telemetry for us and for you in the future most probably to understand how much your solutions have been used. Uh, we also fixed a couple of bugs that are worth mentioning, one of them being the ability to uh, have your uh, specific uh, uh, image as part of the app pages, which was one of the things that had been missed for, link for a long time. And as I was saying, we also enabled the SharePoint framework solution for SharePoint and SharePoint and Teams available from store. It's a V1 from store. We'll talk about store in a little bit further um, in the next slide, but uh, it was a way for us to uh, have a uh, an ability to uh, publish your solutions in the app source. So let's talk about that a little bit. We have been quiet, not too much uh, vocal on what we are doing. And of course, thanks COVID that we didn't have the opportunity to see each other in events to talk about that even further. But let's see if this is one of the opportunity to talk about that. So first of all, we are doing a lot of work on performances. On performances and. Uh, we also worked together with Andre on being able to uh, be more performant, being able to create tools and capabilities for your solution to be more performant, and being able to surface that information in various places so that you can control and you can uh, monitor the performance implication and impact of your solution on SharePoint pages. And as part of this effort, we are also working on a more robust and broad uh, guidelines and samples that you will find in docs.microsoft.com. In terms of uh, permission and authorization, so one of the things that we have released uh, as part of the broader API, that's not strictly SharePoint framework, but it's part of the um, API ecosystem in SharePoint. We have created uh, the ability to uh, disable app-only ACS tokens. So the, um, the feedback here was, or the scenario here was, uh, hey, uh, AAD has this great capability to create conditional access policies so that, for example, I can stop calling a specific SharePoint API if the solution is not running from my network. And you guys have a way to do that uh, and completely bypass the conditional access policies. And I can do that by creating a, an app only app reg in solution using uh, SharePoint APIs. And it was just like, oh, gee, that's true because we created that technology way before conditional app. Uh, conditional access policies were a thing. So what we did, we created the, the ability to disable that functionality. So for existing tenants, as a tenant admin, you can use PowerShell, disable that. That will completely shut off app-only ACS tokens and app-only add-ins, but um, it will basically completely relay on Azure Active Directory for token access and ability to call APIs in SharePoint. Oh, the other thing that we are doing, which I know has been somewhat painful, um, is the ability to move to msal.js. So let's talk about that a little bit. A couple of things are happening in this area. So the first thing is, finally, we are rolling uh, uh, msal.js. So without you guys doing anything on your solution, assuming that you have properly used uh, the SharePoint framework libraries for 
authorization uh, that have been documented in, Mac, in docs at Microsoft.com. We are replacing uh, ADAL.js with MSAL.js v1. That's a first step, and I want to emphasize the v1 part of this statement. So with that, we will do a couple of things. First off, we will be able to enable MSAL uh, libraries, which is still using uh, um, implicit grant flow for um, getting tokens from Azure Active Directory and calling your favorite web API, including, including Microsoft Graph. But it will use the latest libraries. And we have also uh, provided some kind of functionalities and workarounds for the intelligent tracking protection or ITP that Safari released a while ago, as well as the one that is now uh, available in uh, Chrome incognito mode. So you will see that with this release, uh, while we are releasing it, once we have released the MSAL.js, we will also be able to have a workaround so that uh, uh, if you have ITP or you're using incognito, you will still now be able to acquire token, basically. So we, we have coded kind of a cleverish way to uh, avoid that while we're waiting for MSAL v um, And then the work that we are doing is on two folds. One is on adopting MSAL v2, and with MSAL v2, we will have a code transition flow, which is the right from identity standpoint way to acquire tokens and do token ex code token exchanges for scenarios like ITP as well as incognito. And the other thing that we are doing, we are working more for enabling uh, full support of uh, SharePoint framework solutions that use uh, access on tokens uh, of rich clients. And the way we are doing that is by solving some of the problems that we are using with the current infrastructure. So the current infrastructure is relying on some conditions that needs to be met in order for the SPFX solution team to be able to acquire tokens. One of these conditions is that the user has to have visited SharePoint at least once. Uh, we are getting rid of that so that pure Teams solution that uh, will only surfaces in Teams uh, will still be able to uh, work properly and consume tokens uh, without the need for the end user to visit SharePoint. Uh, Pat, do you want to add anything here? No, I think that's uh, that's right. Yeah, the the off stuff is proving to be tricky, particularly with all of the extra security that the browsers and incognito and stuff are putting on the standard auth flows uh, because the authentication happens on like login.microsoft.com. The browsers think that that's a different uh, domain. And so it blocks a whole bunch of stuff, which is uh, what we're spending a lot of our time uh, trying to refine and work out. Right. Plus uh, a couple of additional things to mention here. And OK, Luca, you're making a lot of excuses. Yes, but they are valid excuses. So let me tell you about them. So the first one is that. Authorization code flow in the way that has been released in MSAL v2 works very, very well for uh, single page applications, which we are not, especially as you guys know, SPFX is not for single page applications. So we are working with the Azure Active Directory and Entity team to ensure that they are adding, they are adding features and capabilities, both server side and client side in the entity space to be able to solve our Microsoft 365 SharePoint framework scenario. So we are working with them. They need to still add code and capabilities in order to enable that. And the second kind of reason why it's taking a little bit longer, call that excuse, uh, fair, is that SharePoint is a very, as you know, SharePoint is a very interesting and complicated beast. Uh, so we have things just like uh, multi-geo, and vanity URLs. And as Pat mentioned, all these things need to be carefully taken into consideration when you talk about uh, uh, identity and uh, authorization. So the right, right reply URL needs to be stamped in the right uh, app principle in Azure Active Directory. And when a new geo is created, we need to take care about these things as well. So. It's a complicated, but we're working on that, and hopefully we will be able to share news pretty much soon on that. Oh, yeah. Next topic is Teams improvements. 
uh, we are working very, very hard with the team's team. That's very hard to say every time I say that. To be able to uh, have even a better um, experience for SharePoint Framework solution in facing in Teams, not only web, but also rich client and mobile. Uh, one area that we are working on that is the authorization and authentication, uh, which is MSA LD2, but also more stuff. And the other area that we are focusing on very much is around store. So as you know, our V1 release for SharePoint Framework in store, uh, it's kind of a high trusted, for lack of a better word, uh, approach where the admin, the SharePoint admin, needs to be involved for the solution to be able to surface in your tenancy. We are doing work to avoid that. So we are enabling what is called, what we call, kind of an end user acquisition flow where the end user from Microsoft Teams will be able to navigate the store, surface the solution that he or she wants to add, click on that, and build a streamlined process where the solution lands to the app catalog and can run on Teams. As part of that, there is, again, the authorization and permission that needs to be uh, solved. So we are working to be able to have a kind of a super isolated model or end user acquisition isolated model where the object in uh, the SharePoint framework solution once run in Teams, which is already an iframe because that's the model that Teams has, will run from a domain that has zero access to uh, automatically, zero access to SharePoint content context or any other context until unless the information is provided by the uh, teams as well as by the permission model. And on top of that, we are considering uh, enabling for this specific scenario and user consent so that the admin can be completely left out of the picture. And as part of that, we are doing also work to uh, support better mobile capabilities and functionality for SharePoint frameworks in Microsoft Teams. Uh, Pat, do you want to Talk about the last one, inner loop improvements, or anything else that any set of teams that you think is worth mentioning? No, I think that's that's good. Uh, yeah, so we're, I think there was a question about uh, support for Node 12 and upcoming Node 14 and so forth. Uh, and so this is all part of the, the inner loop tool chain improvements. Uh, we know that there's a chunk of work to do here. It's on our backlog. Um, the, the tricky thing right now with supporting things like Node 12 is that Node 12 requires Gulp 4, and the tooling right now is based on Gulp 3. So we know we have a, a collection of sort of cascading work that we need to get sorted out uh, for the, uh, the updated tool chain. Um, and then I think sort of and how to improve that with the previous uh, Teams improvements that you were mentioning before. Um, the hosted workbench, uh, I think there's, you've seen maybe one or two improvements in there. Uh, the goals we have around there sort of tie into this first uh, entry for performance improvements where we want to make it easier when running in the hosted workbench to get uh, diagnostic information, uh, flag certain things in your solution to say, hey, it looks like you're doing this, this, or this. Um, here's some documentation to read on some best practices. So we want to try and make it as as easy as possible to know when you are uh, basically building code that will be uh, performant in the system. So that's what we talked about this slide. So yeah. we some other thing I think was asking for you what's next here. So sure, we can we can go to the Q and A uh, questions on the uh, on the things. So uh, Sip is asking any update on the SPFX store to Team Store process, having our SPFX apps available in the Team Store. Ah, you should answer on that. <laughs> you can answer <laughs> on that as well. I was on the same meeting, so. Uh, so uh, yes, um, we are working on that. The good news here is that, technically speaking. Uh, all the features and capabilities are there in the right place. Uh, it's just a matter to be able from the time that the solution gets validated to surface in the right store. And that is the latest piece in the, the latest piece, the latest piece in the puzzle that is missing. And I mean to give credit where credit are, 
uh, Vesa is doing a tremendous job here and is working very, very hard to fill these last pieces. And when that is done, the promise is that you will be able to submit your team solution. You will have to do no changes in your submission process. You will only need to be sure that the manifest in the team's solution uh, has the right properties that basically says the team solution that, only, that also supports SharePoint and in which manner, app pages versus web part. And uh, uh, we will be able, after the solution has been validated, to also publish the solution in the SharePoint angle of App Stores or App Source, I'm sorry, so that the admin will be able to install that from store just like any other solution in uh, App Source. So look at the questions upside down. So if we have an SPFX solution, which is targeted for Microsoft Teams, which is I think much more common scenario for Sebastian is from Valo Intranet as an example. So using then SPFX solutions for Teams. But I talked about that in the previous slide. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, so all of that is coming and all of that is again. So yes, we, we are testing. working uh, again. Uh, quick recap. Yes, we are working to enable the scenario. Uh, we were so that the end user will be able to streamline, install a SharePoint framework solution from Teams. As part of that, there is a big thing that we are doing, which is this new end user acquisition solution mode so that your solution that using Microsoft Graph or any other web API will be able to surface in Teams without the uh, involvement of the tenant admin to be able to either approve and deploy the solution in the app catalog. Sure. Then Alex is asking, uh, oh no, that was uh, Russell is asking, any updates on SPFX to create Outlook Office edits? No. <laughs> the solution is still there, it's still in preview. Um, as part of uh, the work that the office uh, team is doing, uh, other priorities have hit the um, their backlog, so they're put pause on that. It's not removed, which is the reason why it's still in preview, but uh, we are not expecting news or improvements, uh, at least uh, for 2020 on this area. Cool. Uh, then there was a question related on the additional extension placeholders, which is one of which was in the pretty high on the user voice list as well. So any, any updates on that one? Uh, unfortunately, we do not have any updates there. I want to echo what Vesa said before here. Please, please, please raise up that number in user voice because we need your help to be able to advocate what you guys need. Um, so that uh, other teams can work with us in order to be able to show up and to enable features and functionalities that you need. But for that now, for now, at least in 2020, no, we don't have any updates or improvements that I can talk for uh, extensions in pages. Yeah. Good. Uh, Erkan was asking, any plans for the SharePoint Server 2019? Unfortunately, still stuck in React 15 and SPFX 1.4. So, not for 2019. So let's spend a couple of minutes here. So, 2019 upgrading on-prem servers is getting more and more difficult. And uh, overall, we have taken the approach where once a feature has been released. Uh, uh, we only provide the security updated improvements, and that's kind of a bad news. But the good news is that we have a kind of a more uh, expedite um, pace for new versions. So what I'm trying to say here is that we're not expecting to provide any shipper framework updates in 2019. However, we are working to have more functionalities around SharePoint framework where possible for the next release of on-prem, uh, whatever it will be called, you know, the next release or feature pack or 2019 plus uh, plus. Honestly, I don't know, I'm not making jokes, it's just like there is no, uh, it, as far as I'm aware, I have no idea on, the, on what will be the name over there, but anyway, the idea here is that we will be able to, or we are working with the feature team in order to 
provide some of the functionalities that exist in SharePoint framework uh, online in the next version of SharePoint on-prem. Yeah. Um, and I, I will follow up on some of the questions or I'll follow up on some of the questions later. We need to move to the answer in a second. There was one question which is really good from Gautam. Feature request support for live reload and SPFX solutions in SPFX workbench built in toolchain. Also, maybe something like Teams workbench to test team solutions. So stay question or comment from Gautam. You want to take this part? Yeah, uh, sure. Yes, totally uh, understood. Um, that is one of the one of the, the next things to smooth out the uh, that sort of better with teams uh, scenario. Um, ideally, it should be uh, the same flow as I can run gulp serve and I can uh, test my stuff in teams, not have to do a complete build package it, deploy it, uh, sync it, push it, add the app like uh, it's clear that it's possible to succeed. It's not easy to succeed. And so we want to do work to make it easy to succeed. So yes, cool. in a bunch of more words. <laughs> yeah. So and uh, from a timing perspective, we do apologize. We do have two topics today. Um, and if needed, we can we can certainly set up a more time for SPFX Q&A together with Luca and Pat in the future. Please let us know uh, on, on uh, if that's useful for you. We might want to actually maybe take one of the SPFX community calls uh, for Q&A at some point if that's suitable. But because entry is in the call, we want to actually give entry also time to do a quick, uh, well, not a super quick, but good, anyway, a demo around the performance improvements. And maybe we'll see the project nucleus as well. Do we see it entry today? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll do a live Excellent. demo. Hopefully Ooh. everything works. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> it will, it will. And I'll answer some of the questions which are uh, pending on the chat window at least. But Andrew, just share your screen and take it away. Sounds great. Awesome. All right, so yeah, so I wanted to spend a few minutes just talking about how we approach web application performance in OneDrive and SharePoint web applications. Um, so we'll specifically touch on you know the two topics. So how do we approach web app perf across the web apps? What are some of the primary metrics that we use to track whether we're improving performance or not? And talk a little bit about our goals. And finally, we'll conclude with Project Nucleus. So I'll do a few live demos, and then I'll have an, an exciting announcement to share at the end as well. So like, what is performance? So before we dive into the presentation, I want to make sure that you understand what we define by, by performance. So when we talk about making our web applications fast, what do we mean? So the truth is that performance is, is relative, obviously. So for example, you can consider two different scenarios. So there's two web applications, and then they finish loading at the exact same time. One application might seem to load faster if it loads content progressively, rather than waiting until the end to display anything, right? Or another scenario could be a web app might be faster for one user that's on a fast network, you know, on a powerful device, and can be slow for another user that's on a slow network with a low-end device. Um, and a web app might appear to load quickly, but then respond slowly or not at all to use interaction. So these are kind of simple scenarios to keep in mind uh, when I can continue talking about uh, performance and the work that we're doing uh, in Wonder and SharePoint. Uh, and we always, we always uh, talk in terms of objective criteria when we talk about performance that can be essentially quantitatively measured. And importantly, it can be quantitatively measured and consistent and be, be consistent across various uh, SharePoint SharePoint web apps. So, with that in mind, so let's take a look at some of the key user moments in loading and interacting with a web application that we're focusing on currently. Fundamentally, our aspiration is to obviously load the page and render the most relevant content to you as the user as fast as possible, and uh, to ensure that you as the user can interact with that content, uh, and that interaction is very smooth and efficient. And so we can think of a page load process comprising of four different stages. Um, so the first stage is you know, re really corresponds to whether you know, the user perceived to be page to actually load. The next page corresponds to whether the displayed page uh, content is actually useful to the user, followed by is it actually usable? So essentially, can the user interact with it? And finally, are those you know, page interactions seamless and smooth? And we primarily rely on two metrics. So there's, there's a host of other supplementary metrics that we also track and measure, but we're currently focusing on two, two, two metrics. 
Uh, the first one is called First Meaningful Paint, and it's just a measure of how fast we can paint the most relevant content on the screen. And the second one is a measure of page interactivity, which we call, uh, call as first, first CPU idle, or FCI for short. Uh, you can lar largely think of it as being an analogous to another metric that you might be familiar with. It's called uh, time to interactive. But again, it just measures how uh, can um, our web pages become interactive and respond to user input. And so just fundamentally, the two goals that we have is really just to reduce the time to first meaningful paint, essentially show, show, show the content on the screen as fast as possible, and essentially minimize the difference between the first meaningful paint and then first CPU idle. And what that really means is that we want to make sure that once the content is displayed on the screen, it's interactive as soon as the user essentially can see it. And we have multiple approaches to measuring web performance. Um, so we rely on web measurements and uh, real user measurements. So web measurements allow us to have a consistent and uh, reproducible method for evaluating web perf across you know, various builds. Uh, and we usually rely on, rely on lab measurements as the first line of defense for, you know, for any possible regressions. But ultimately, we rely on real user measurements as the source of truth of how our web apps perform in the wild um, and ensure that all the users across the globe are reaping the benefits of the work that we're putting into making the web apps faster. And specifically, we're focusing on two different percentiles uh, when it comes to improving web app performance. Uh, so we are primarily optimizing for the 75th percentile of our users uh, because it allows us to understand how the majority of our users uh, experience the web applications on most common types of networks. But we're also focusing on the 95th percentile as well because it allows us to understand how users on slower networks or lower end devices experience the web apps. And for us, it's very important that we focus on both. Uh, so now let's take a look at you know, the primary metrics that I just, just described. So we use, again, uh, first meaningful paint as the measure of page content load times. Um, and in OneDrive and SharePoint web apps, we optimize for rendering of primary content first, uh, such as you know, the frequent site sections on SharePoint Home or whatever is visible currently in the viewport on, you know, on SharePoint, SharePoint pages. Um, and the measure, the recording and measurement approaches are slightly different between static pages with kind of like static or immutable layouts, such as you know SharePoint Home, and for pages that have you know dynamic layout, right, and the highly customizable, such as such as SharePoint pages. Um, so again, we rely on the same metric, but we record it slightly differently. So the first CPU uh, idle metric, again, that's a metric that we rely on to measure interactivity of of our web pages. Um, and in essence, um, uh, first CPU idle is measured when the, uh, the main thread of the browser becomes, uh, becomes idle. So essentially, there's no, there's no tasks, there's no long tasks that the browser is, browser is busy with. So that means that the browser thread is now, um, uh, is now available to uh, reliably respond to, to user input. Uh, so uh, this metric is very deterministic um, and allows us to to really understand when the user can actually use, use, use our web applications. Two primary metrics that, that, we, that we focus on, but again, we have a host of other supplementary metrics that we're also tracking, but our focus is on these two for now. So now let's take a look at the performance goals that we have for our web applications. So in a nutshell, we are targeting to paint uh, relevant content on the screen across our web apps uh, um, in uh, two seconds or less at 75th percentile uh, and at uh, four seconds or less at 95th percentile across our web apps. The only exception is uh, just, just because the, the, the content is so dynamic um, and is largely influenced by you know, whatever web parts you put on the page. So that's why our goals are a little bit more conservative for, for SharePoint pages. And when it comes to interactivity, we're shooting for three seconds at P, uh, P75 and six seconds at uh, P95. So these are some of our co-current internal goals. And again, we, we're, we're in constant pursuit of making our web apps faster. And once we achieve these goals, we'll, I'm sure, set more, more aggressive targets. And one last thing that I wanted to mention is that the majority, the, well, the vast majority of the work that we're putting into making uh, our web applications faster primarily focus on modern browsers. So if you want to reap all the benefits that we're putting into, into the perf work, 
we highly encourage you to move to modern browsers such as the Microsoft Edge or the Chromium based based browsers because IE 11 and Microsoft Edge, Edge legacy are being being retired in the middle of next year. So that's just kind of some, something to keep in mind. All right, so let's talk about Project Nucleus. So if you haven't heard, so Project Nucleus is a, an exciting new technology that will power the next generation of OneDrive and SharePoint web applications. So we're starting um, our journey with uh, integrating uh, Project Nucleus with uh, Microsoft Lists, and I'll show you how it, how it kind of all works. Um, but in a nutshell, Project Nucleus helps deliver fast and uh, smooth experiences um, when interacting with the web app. And also, it makes the web application data available uh, to you regardless of the network state. So you can be on bad connection, fast connection. Uh, the data is always available to you, even, and even if you're offline, of course. Um, and Project Nucleus accomplishes this by establishing a very durable cache of the web app data on your local device. And that web app data is not just limited to files, right? Like in the case of OneDrive, OneDrive Sync client. So we're moving way beyond files here. Um, and then we're syncing the data with the web app uh, using a standard set set of APIs. So same set of APIs that are used, you know, to sync the web app data with the cloud backend. And as a result, you'll be able to get fast, powerful uh, browsing and editing capabilities when you're not even connected to the network. And the beauty of Project Nucleus is that we're building it on top of an extensible framework that will allow different web applications to take advantage of uh, its capabilities. Like I said, we're starting with uh, Microsoft Lists first, uh, but we uh, will follow it uh, by uh, other ODSP web applications. Before I go into the demo, I wanted to kind of cover some of the challenges that motivated us to start working on Project Nucleus. Um, so we've started on a journey of transitioning or transforming our web applications to uh, become progressive web apps. And while progressive web apps provide you know, great capabilities such as you know, local installation, native app-like behavior, um, and offer some um, yet you know, limited offline capabilities, um, we really needed to think beyond progressive web app in order to be able to provide fast access for very large and very complex data sets that you find in SharePoint every day. Um, also be able to provide experiences regardless of network connection quality and making sure that all of our users get reliable performance under periods of heavy use. Um, and again, um, we ultimately wanted to provide a very you know, full and comprehensive web app experiences when you know, the, our users um, are working with our web apps you know, when fully offline, such as on the train or in, or in a plane. So let me switch gears a little bit and show you a demo. Let me share my screen. Let's see. Let me know if you can see it. Yep, we got it. Yes, so, so what I'm showing here is um, a Nucleus powered uh, list. So you, you can kind of tell that it's, you know, there's something special about the list by you know, an indication of a little sync icon over here. So this is a very, very large list. Uh, so it has uh, 100,000 items in it. So it's just, just a sample kind of hardware inventory list that I kind of created just to demonstrate what, what's, what's possible. Uh, we've tried um, a nucleus with lists with up to one one million items, and I'm sure we can go even higher. So, you know, the possibilities are endless as far as you know, supporting very large, very large entities and list lists in this this example. Um, and so, I just wanted to kind of quickly show what's happening what's happening behind the scenes. So I'm just going to pop my dev tools over here, and let's say I wanted to you know sort uh, sort this list by the condition column. And so something interesting happens. So over here, you can see that we're seeing a bunch of nucleus log lines, right? And then what actually happened is that when I click sort button, it didn't go to the service. So it went directly to nucleus. So as you can see, it says call, call redirected. And then it, and then it shows you the amount of time it took to, com to complete the call. Um, and if we look at the network over here, so this particular API is, you know, it's the API that does all the heavy, heavy lifting uh, when it comes to retrieving data from the service. So this API was actually executed by Nucleus. And so if, you, if we take a look at it, you can see that it went to the local host rather to, to the SharePoint service. Um, and it returned the results in two milliseconds. So it's instantaneous. 
And again, you can continue up, you know, continue doing the exact same things that you were used to doing with the list. You can sort columns, you can group columns, you can filter by by uh, by different fields. And again, Nucleus will handle those requests. Um, and again, all of this will work even when 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 you're when you're offline. So this was just a quick quick demo, and I wanted to conclude by. Um, inviting all of you uh, to express your interest in participating in a private uh, private preview uh, of Project Nucleus. Um, so we would love uh, for you to, to be the first ones to try it out. So all you have to do is go to AKMS um, uh, slash Nucleus Preview. And I'm just asking to fill out the, some basic form, just kind of share, share, your, uh, share your information and then share a little bit about some of the scenarios that you currently um, go through when working with Microsoft Lists and some, some of the pain points. So it's, it's going to take you two or three minutes to complete. Um, and in a few weeks' time, so we're, we'll reach out to you with instructions on how you can opt in and uh, start um, uh, playing around with Nucleus. And we're really looking forward to your feedback. Yeah, before I let you go, I have to get back on this. There's a few questions related on chat as expected questions, which is of course. what about yeah. third party and how are we expecting this to work with SharePoint framework? Uh, so our aspiration is to definitely open up, uh, open uh, Project Nucleus up to third party and to SPFX, but it's currently not yet supported, but definitely in the plans. So we'll share more once once we have more concrete concrete plans in place. So it's, it's definitely just to recap on that one, not intended to be only for uh, first party experience um, and certainly we understand the importance of partners and customers. Now, um, well, we do have three minutes. How is the security of cached data insert? A uh, question from Dragon. Security, I mean, it's we follow the highest security practices to make sure that data is only available to you and nobody else. So it's all, all, all encrypted. So everything is, is basically obviously the priority is that security is one of the main priorities in Microsoft yeah. always. Uh, so therefore, uh, we'll take care of that. Uh, and there was a few questions related on the, during your presentation that partly a joke. I think it was Ahmed who chatted it and then no, 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 I was joking. And uh, basically saying, no, no, this is only for Microsoft browsers, but no, 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 this is industry standards, uh, any browser or other limitations on that. Can you break up on that one, Andre? Uh, so, service. Which 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 part of the presentation are you referring to? So it's what are the browsers which will be supported by Nucleus, or is it all of the browsers and modern browsers? And, oh yes. Yeah. So, recap on that. Yeah. So for now, all all modern browsers will will be supported. So you know, yeah. it'll work in work in Firefox. Um, uh, but for now, so if you're joining private preview, just a few a few caveats. It's uh, for now it's Windows only um, and Chromium browsers only for now. Uh, but again, this is this is not the restrictions when, once once we go GA. Yep. Cool. Cool. And that's that's also going to be a new new way. Well, not a new way, but that's how we do stuff in Microsoft nowadays, which is industry standards, open source, everything open, um, and we need to do that in the future as well. But I think uh, that's pretty much it for now. Uh, uh, there's technical questions from Christian, like how many, uh, how long does it take to update the information and uh, the list data back to get visible on the client and all of that. But I think those are technical nuances uh, and all of that is adjustable. Yeah. So um, it, the intention is that it's everything is handled automatically, merging is handled mm -hmm. automatically uh, and all of that. So you don't have to worry about you as an, you don't just see what happens in the background. So what's a frequent. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's do yeah, yeah sorry. just quick, quickly question uh, to answer it. Yeah, it's a uh, we follow a notification based based approach. So the moment there is a notification uh, that an item has changed, we'll we'll sync it down or sync yeah. it up if it was a offline change. And so, Anna is this. asking the last question, really good one. Can existing list be transformed to be in a nucleus list? And the answer is Yes, it can. Yes. It's not, not about the list. It's, an, it's not about when the list has been created. It's all about us taking care of the technology behind of the scenes. So every single list, the whole web application, potentially modern pages, portals, everything will be um, handled by the nucleus in the in the future. But again, one step at a time, still in preview, 
we need to review stuff first and then ensure that it's 100% fully working across the board and then we can release that uh, in the GA. Now we're running out of time, we are hitting the hours, so uh, just to close up for the day, the recording will be available in 24 hours in the Microsoft 365 community YouTube channel, AKMS N365 PMP videos. Uh, follow us on Microsoft 365 Dev, M365 PMP. Next uh, M365 general community call is on this week, Thursday at 7 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, more on Microsoft Teams specific this time and Microsoft Lists. We're going to talk about cool demos over there, Chris Kent, uh, engineering from Microsoft Teams and all of that. Uh, next SharePoint Framework community call is on 22nd of October, SharePoint community call in November 10th. And there's a lot of additional community calls as well. So if you're interested on a specific area like Microsoft Craft, you can subscribe to those community calls and that happens in a once a month. But AKMS M365 dev calls is the location where you can find the list of everything. But thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Luca. Thank you, Pat. Uh, and thank you for really active discussion once again in a chat. Uh, I think that's really, really important uh, that we help each other in the chat during this calls. Um, but thank you, thank you, thank you. I will share the together mode pictures and social media hopefully later today or tomorrow. So thank you for that. We got actually two of them uh, if you saw that in the chat. But again, thank you for this one. And let's stay in touch. Remember to provide feedback, 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 feedback. Uh, super important thing. Thank you, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.